What's up, everybody? This is Carrick with ACG, and as always, it's my continuing mission to bring you reviews that aren't two minutes long or filled with sponsored bullcrap. And today, we're looking at Far Cry Primal. Oh, wait. No, that's actually Far Cry New Dawn. Wait, no, no, it's Far Cry Primal. Or is it? Far Cry New Dawn tells a continuing tale of the land that Joseph Seed spent years kicking the shit out of, and then just because he was bored and more than a bit batshit insane, he also nuked, depending on one of the endings. You play as the Cap, returning to the land that the Rook originally found in the prior title, because apparently Ubisoft likes to name people in successive order of rank, just like their games. New Dawn is out February 15th for $39.99. Let's see how it did, shall we? As always, if you liked the video, eh, maybe subscribe. So here's my review for Far Cry New Dawn. Fire's beautiful, all hail the Rockalo, and a world where the scariest people in it are the women's motocross division. Graphics start first. So if you played Far Cry 5 when it comes to the performance and the idiosyncrasies, you've played this game, which means on the console, fairly steady, 30 FPS, a long draw distance, but a hell of a lot of pop in. That doesn't stop the local locations you go to from being nice cluttered affairs from time to time, and some look like they were basically ripped directly out of a Mad Max game and then plopped into Far Cry 5's lush setting. And lush is the real strange word here. It's only 17 years after the main ending of the original game, resulting in a mega bloom. That's when vegetation begins to grow back into areas, especially since the human waste baskets have all been curbed down to acceptable numbers. But as is the typical style of Ubisoft, they had to rub something unique in there, and that means before long you're going to be running along in the wilderness fighting off bison who look like they fell into a glue factory and then fucked a rock quarry somewhere. You're going to see albino deer sprinting around with glowing eyes and pink shiny horns. In fact, you're going to see pink a lot. It's like God picked out all the other colors from nature's skittles and then just threw the pink ones around the world and said grow, and it was good. He also apparently said that to cars, because a number of cars perfectly slammed into the ground vertically like someone was trying to see if they could make a Ford fruit tree is insanely high and comical at times when you're racing around the land in your sidecar motorbike with its half horsepower engine and questionable driver killing all the wildlife around you. Now, when it comes to the setup of the world, it is a bit smaller. It's bigger than the DLCs, but it's truncated compared to the main titles, and that's fine. When it comes to a standalone expansion like this, I can't say that wasn't unexpected. There are some locations too dangerous to travel to that are closed off from radiation. Yet at the same time, the entire time you're playing this game, you feel like there's a sameness compared to Far Cry 5. It looks like you're in one of Faith's fever dreams. Dream sequences of a kind do make a return here. Speaking of return, we get some guns, some vehicles, some up-close weapons, and the NPCs all look like they've been run through a somewhat passable apocalyptica generator, with guns having nuts and bolts keeping them together, and a hodgepodge of parts attached to them, like old Mythbusters specials. There are 81 weapons with over 20 vehicles, some with designs that are very Mad Max inspired, but then you're going to randomly also see some replica of a Chevy Corsica come ripping down a road being chased by a tri-wheel motorbike with a 50 caliber tape to its back. Worse yet, the heinous bases you end up getting. Talk about sucking the uniqueness out of a location. In the past games, some spots had the feeling of a ragtag location put together by those in the wilderness with a high level of anarchy and very little in the way of overt law to watch them. This is years after a mini apocalypse and you happen to be living in a giant house perfectly situated on a hill, corded off into easy sections for the upgrading mini game. It looks artificial, and you know what? It is. What's all this get you? What's the performance? It's pretty much identical to Far Cry 5, regardless of what console or the PC that you're playing on. It ran smooth originally for me, so I would say that's pretty much what you're going to get here. The Pro and the Xbox offer some increased resolutions that look to be almost identical with the original game, so don't really expect a huge increase from that title. As with the past titles in this series, you can turn all the HUD elements off, which I personally feel adds a bit of immersion that might help people who just can't seem to get past going from one highlighted checkpoint to another, and then another, and then another. It doesn't stop the entire game from feeling very familiar. It's the original marked with the supposed functionality of a current wasteland present that doesn't actually always work. It feels like it's Far Cry 5 pretending to be post-apocalyptic. As a package, I would say it's as solid as the original game, if you felt that one was solid. If you didn't, well, you're going to get the same thing here. Sound, music, and voice. And let's go with sound first. 
expect nothing surprising or really that new here. It's just like the prior titles. Take an arrow to the neck of an enemy at almost supersonic speed, and it's always going to result in that wet, squishy, we have a vendetta against watermelons in the fully sound recording booth kind of womp to it. And I like that. There does seem to be a bit more accuracy on the sound, though, resulting in deep valley battles reverberating around you, as well as the slightest hint of audio occlusion and echo. But this one in particular almost seems tied directly to explosions and the parts that come off of vehicles, for instance. Directionally, you can almost always tell where a battle is coming from, though there were a couple times this was difficult. But I would say, if you've ever heard gunshots in the woods, it's not always that easy anyway. When it comes to the sound environmentally, I really actually liked it, especially the first time you look at a mountain and say, let's see if we can burn that fucker down and fires all around you and whipping up. And it really works to encapsulate that violence a bit in the sound. Side elements like folk singers strumming along in guitars in your main bass do help as well. Lastly, this happened. <laughs> And of course, that brings us to music. Far Cry has been nailing the theme music lately. Far Cry 5 had some of the best main menu music in a game, and to me, overall in the year. And I love the subtle switchover that occurs in New Dawn with a guitar-laced sad country theme that plays along with this wailing synth, both taking turns leading in that main menu music. Very cool, and it overlays into some excellent battle music as well. As a complete package, I'd say the musical scoring in Far Cry 5 and in New Dawn are excellent. They have good instrumental pieces as well as those more moody and macabre moments when you start vision tripping the shit out of the game world like you made a soup from pure DMT and whatever mushrooms you found growing in your backyard in a pile of pig shit. It is pretty robust stuff and certainly not a place where I would complain about these games. That does bring us to voice. When the cutscenes were working, voice was fine. Without spoiling much, you do have a couple returns from the folks who made it through inevitable radioactive thrashings that John sent your way in the last game. Far Cry 5 isn't really about nuance for anyone, and there are some times where you can tell someone was told to just look into the screen and scream, and they do just that. It fits the game's over-the-top nature. Having said that, a couple of your teammates, of which there are a total of eight, are very good, with some quoting Bible verses as you Revelations 11.15, a bunch of BMX bike armor wear and screwballs. I do like some of their one-liners, especially when you set up on a giant cat or a dog and their screams of pure terror are hilarious. A lot of it is copied bits from Far Cry 5, with some new elements in the major cutscenes, and of course, your roster of secondary citizens, some you've seen and some you haven't. Voice, pretty good. And that brings us to gameplay and a bit about the story. You play as the Cap. 17 years after the end of Far Cry 5, one train wreck scene later and you're dropped into the Far Cry world. Much changed and, strangely, much the same. First, let's begin with the fact that every Far Cry game starts the same exact way as I joked before. And it's the same here with you scrambling around for pickups as enemies loot the fiery train wreck that they just caused. You're quickly introduced to the Highwaymen, a force of marauders who've taken over the old locations near Eden's Gate. They are led by two twins who spend most of the time shooting people and sitting in the thrones in the back of cars. If I sound like I didn't like the story, you'd be wrong. I like the information at least, but my lord, those two are terrible. And they could have been so good. You might be thinking to yourself, well, Carrick, you didn't mention that in voice. And that's because I don't actually find their performances that bad, even though I had to go and listen to them again. It's when you realize how poor the writing is. Sure, Joseph Seed was a naked man baby, clothed in a ramrod stiff faith that suggested he didn't need to buy shirts, let alone worry too much about bullets. And the dude had obviously watched Poltergeist 2 at least 26 times too many. But here, the main antagonists have none of the weakness or almost subtle gravitas that he did and instead run around chewing up the scenery and making terrible decisions like female twin versions of Nicolas Cage and the friggin' Wicker Man. That's why I mention it here and not in the voice section, because it's not their performances which are fine, it's what they were given, and that's why it's being covered in the story, and what they were given is pretty shit. And yes, yes, I get it. The motto is live for today, but don't worry about tomorrow. These folks don't even worry about today, though, or the next 30 minutes. The shit they do is only done to drive you stiffly through the game mechanics of upgrading your home base and collecting. Strangely enough, the lucky thing about the game and another ding against the story is that these two don't have that much to do in the actual title, and they're gone for long stretches of time. I'm not quite sure we should be counting that as a positive. But hey, you know what? Mechanics are where it's at. Maybe those are good. 
So the game has you setting up main base with a small group of survivors and trying to ready the base for incoming attacks, as well as tell the further stories of some of the characters still or possibly remaining from the prior game. The gunplay felt a bit more refined than Far Cry 5 felt like. It wasn't perfect, but there was a bit more punch to the weapons, and I remember Far Cry 5 having some issues that I didn't run into here. There are less enemies in this game as well, and their AI seems a bit better, which does match to what Ubisoft said when they were making this game. And it could be all that, or it could be the fact that the first weapon you get is a friggin' table saw blade shooting slingshot that ricochets off enemies' heads like a goddamn death pinball, just cutting them down wherever they stand. That never gets old. Those moments continue to be Far Cry's best. Now, as you explore, you gain resources, the main one being petroleum to update and upgrade your base from new vehicle creations to new weapon making abilities to growing your own herbals to paying folks to explore the land and make maps. Each part of your base has multiple upgrade steps, and your base itself overall has three. Now, there are a couple of upgrades that can be done with unique unlock requirements like the main base itself, which does require you search land for specialists with those skills before actually upgrading it. This does continue to tie the character skills into the base upgrading, which actually makes sense to me because building a proper racing team, but letting me drive would be as useless as a fucking pug at a Great Dane breeding facility. Going out and getting some mother hen with a death fetish and a seven foot long sniper rifle should help you defend yourself when enemies actually come to your house. As you continue on, you gather perks like the original title, air suits, the ability to run farther, one shot higher and higher level enemies and so forth. There's a good number of them, but again, not much different from the original game. You can still fish and hunt for wildlife and trade those items back at your base or with walking traders for materials you need for upgrading. One mode that's unlocked a bit into the mid game is called expeditions. Think of this as repeatable raids where you take out specific locations and they're lodged in enemies. And each time you do it successfully, you have to hightail it back to a waiting helicopter with the stolen goods that happen to have a GPS locator connected to them. Now, ignoring the fact that somehow GPS works in the game world where folks are still shitting in a trench somewhere, notwithstanding, it can be a blast doing those missions. It's basically theft missions, so much of them can be done with a good deal of stealth. Though I was never able to fully go silent without one Peter Pan motherfucker flying in on a zip line, just as I thought I had cleared everyone out. As you successfully perform each of those missions, you get more that are unlocked, and you can go back and up their difficulty and do them again. Also, the game continues to have something that a lot of games don't, which is the ability for those NPCs to drive or attempt to drive. Half the time, if they're within, say, 50 feet of the road, I counted that good. But the number of good guys that they mowed down all the while talking about their terrible childhood was incredibly high and led to some hilarious moments. While you're doing expeditions, upgrading your base and get more characters for your roster, you can also take out enemy outposts and then strangely relinquish them again so you can fill them with harder enemies and take them down again. It feels like the expeditions, but in a smaller form. If you relinquish control, you do get salvage from the base, but it removes your ability to fast travel to them. It's a trade-off, but much like New Dawn, honestly, it feels like busy work, and I think a lot of that is because the game just doesn't feel different enough. From the landscapes that look like someone lived in a Miami Vice video where neon pink was the coolest color and swathed the world in it to the been there, done that mission types, other than those I mentioned. But the biggest miss here has to absolutely be that no one's suffering from the effects of the radiation that would have ravaged their frickin' DNA like a lawnmower topping off the family tree. Instead, this has to be the most robust group of men and women known to man. I'm pretty sure their DNA is somehow encrypted like a friggin' Bitcoin wallet. Even a couple characters make some jokes about it, but it never pays off, and it never feels really like an apocalyptic game where the atmosphere of Mad Max, for example, was lifted up by a large number of genetic and almost hauntingly horrifying freaks that NASCAR'd through the wasteland. Here, the kids are just running around playing tag like no one's the wiser. There was enough radiation in this world that it'd be Pac-Man and people's fertility like it was a nickel arcade. And speaking of nickels, that's money, and that brings us to microtransactions. Yep, they're here. And they're here in force. You use the Far Cry coins to get your stuff, and I will say that it feels like the balance is still set at Far Cry 5, numbers, which means that this is a truncated and smaller experience, but you have these what feels like incredibly expensive items, and especially once you start getting Far Cry coins in the actual game, it feels like their give rate is incredibly low. I just hate the fact that they're in here at all, didn't like them in the prior games, don't like them here. Lots of this might sound bad to you, and yes, a lot of it is, but those expecting a bit more action in a Far Cry world are going to get that. It's just that for the most part, feels like a huge wasted opportunity when it comes to storytelling and world building. Lastly, the length of the game is honestly going to vary a lot as there's a number of side missions and it's going to be about how fast you want to move through the main mission. But since no story is really locked off to you, aside from maybe one or two that require specialists, you're looking at probably eight to 10 hours for those who don't worry too much about collecting everything or doing everything and adding to that as you go. I was a little bit above 10. 
Possibly shorter, though, if you fast travel everywhere, which I don't really do. And of course, that brings us to fun factor. It is fun at times, and a great deal of fun. It is very difficult to not crack a smile when taking down some legendary bear that just snickersnacked through an entire enemy legion and then trading its skin in for machinery parts. The audacity of that is hilarious. The cycle of gameplay in that is actually robust. And of course, you can jump in co-op with a friend if you like this kind of thing. The game's also tempered some of the craziness from the first title and lowered the overall populace a bit, so it feels less reckless. And the AI, like I said, does feel a little bit smarter, though you certainly do have some hilarious occasions when someone is stuck on the side of a car as the force burns down around them. They can't seem to figure out what fire is. New Dawn is a true expansion, more and longer than the prior DLCs, but less than a full game. Its story does take and build upon the title's past, and for that I give it credit. But other than that, it doesn't do a lot to bring me personally back. So as you guys know, I rate games on a buy, wait for sale, rent, or never touch it again rating system with rent being replaced by deep, deep sale on PC. Even with this price point, this is a wait for a deep, deep sale. Something maybe since it's $39.99, possibly five or 10 bucks. It is better than the DLC. I really do believe that it is more enjoyable than the DLC. I got to hand it to him. Going up against Rage and other post-apocalyptic titles in this day and age is actually a little bit risky. And I would have liked for them to succeed because I actually think they could have and in many places, their gunplay is quite unique, especially as we've seen with Blood Dragon. It just doesn't really work for me here. So that's it for me. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up. If you dislike it, give it a thumbs down. Maybe follow me on Twitch or Twitter or Instagram. And of course, you can become a patron on the Patreon website to help me continue to give you guys reviews that aren't two minutes long or filled with sponsored bullcrap. And as always, I buy a copy of every single game, even if I get a code from a developer and give it away to a patron. Peace out and enjoy the rest of your week.